Permit me to introduce the brilliant young plastic surgeon, Dr. Philip Schleicher, the greatest nose job man in the entire universe and Beverly Hills. Your Highness. Nose job? I don't understand. She's already had a nose job. It was a sweet 16 present. No, it's not what you think. It's much, much worse. If you do not give me the combination to the air shield, Dr. Slotkin will give your daughter back her old nose. No! Where did you get that? All right, I'll tell. I'll tell. No, Daddy, no, you mustn't. You're right, my dear. I'll miss your new nose, but I will not tell on the combination no matter what. Very well. Dr. Schlotkin, do your worst. My pleasure. <laughs> no! Wait, wait! I'll tell. I'll tell. I knew it would work. All right, give it to me. The combination is... One... One, one, two, 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 three, 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 four, 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 five, five, five. So the combination is one, two, three, four, five. That's the stupidest combination I ever heard in my life. That's the kind of thing an idiot would have on his luggage. Thank you, your highness. What did you do? I turned off the wall. Uh, Clayton, you turned off the whole movie. I must have pressed the wrong button. Well, put it back on. Put the yes, movie sir, back yes, on. Yes, sir. Yes, oh. sir. You gotta get that thing fixed. We're back, oh. and we have the combination. Oh. Lock it. What? We're done with you. Go back to the golf course and work on your putts. Let's go, Arnold. Come, Gretchen. Of course, you know I'll still have to bill you for this. Oh, I bet she gives great helmet. Well, did it work? Where's the gate? It works, sir. We have the combination. Great. Now we can take every last breath of fresh air from planet Druidia. What's the combination? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five? Yes. That's amazing. I've got the same combination on my luggage. <laughs> Prepare space ball one for immediate departure. Yes, sir. And change the combination on my luggage. Ah! Welcome back to Computer Science 50. This is the end of week three, and that's meant to be a teaser for problem set two. So whereas the standard edition of this problem set has you implementing a Caesar cipher and a Visionaire cipher, those of you who are so inclined can take on the hacker edition of the problem set this week, which challenges you to crack passwords, perhaps as simplistic as that, but perhaps more sophisticated still. So if you weren't inclined to do the hacker edition of P set zero or even one because you felt perhaps discouraged from it, I would at least Give yourself the opportunity of skimming or reading the spec for problem set two because they are not in order of magnitude more work or more difficult, but just different. And they might assume a little more of the student. They might expect you to go read ahead to figure out some trick. But for the most part, they, they are still accessible to uh, most any students in the course. Um, so I was digging through some of my old folders last night. I'm not sure if you would find this quite as nostalgic as I did, but this was the first page of notes I ever took in CS50, so in 96 when I took it. And what I found amusing was throughout my, my, lecture, my notes to myself from class, I used exclamation points a lot. So apparently important in CS50 is precision and correctness. So we're going to start emphasizing those two things, which I was apparently taught. It looks like the third thing I learned in week zero back then was that a programming is the process of taking an algorithm and putting it into a language a computer can process. My handwriting was clearly as bad then as it is now. Some other interesting tidbits. Apparently, this was the day where I learned where on FAS uh, the standard I.O. library, or at least its header file, was stored. So we've certainly talked about that. Looky here about arguments. We learned about that day. Um, then apparently in section, exclamation points were emphasized yet again. And I was taught in, taught in where are we going? Come on. Taught in section that uh, programming is all about be precise, be correct, and be finite. 
So those two are perhaps some takeaways today. Apparently I learned the term hierarchical decomposition that same section, which I then proceeded to forget for about 11 years because it wasn't until taking over 50 last year that I was sort of reading up on all this stuff and I'm like, oh, that's what that was called. So we might preach it here but realize uh, it's not the jargon so much that's important to us but really the ideas, that one being breaking down code perhaps into um, factorable pieces. On 10-2, 1996, apparently we didn't do that much in lecture. Um, the only takeaway from that lecture was a race started zero. <laughs> so I guess it was, I don't know, I guess it was a, a light day for us. So a couple of announcements. Um, lunch with David and others. About two or four TFs have been joining each week. Just drop us a note so that we can plan accordingly. Uh, the CS50 bot will now respond not only with love but also with directions as to when and where to go for that. Um, use the bulleted board. So especially as it's getting to crunch time at the end of the week here for the this problem set, turn to it not only to see what other students have asked about and therefore hopefully uh, answering some of your own questions, but if you have questions of your own that aren't yet answered, do post them there. And it's, uh, it's either a, a mark of our dedication or a mark of how much else, how little else we apparently have going on um, that usually multiple uh, members of the staff, myself included, respond within minutes. Uh, so it's kind of a neat phenomenon. Um, grades will soon be accessible online. So there's a new link on the left hand side of the website. It won't show you anything just yet. Um, normally we would have turned around piece at zero grades by now. The, fall, the delay is entirely mine, not your teaching fellows, but our plan is to get those out by this weekend with piece at one shortly thereafter and then we'll be back on track. Um, all right, any questions, administrative or otherwise? Okay, so uh, there's this website that some of you are probably familiar with called Slashdot. It's news for nerds, stuff that matters. Um, and there's this neat article posted just today entitled New Contestants on the Turing Test. And this leads you to an article on the UK's uh, paper called The Guardian which I thought I would read because it's, kind, it's certainly accessible, the material that's covered here, but it also speaks to some of the fundamental um, sort of insights that computer scientists and, uh, you know, one of you could point that out to me on occasion, um, <laughs> points to some of the, the fundamental insights that humans have had over the years as to what it means to compute. And Alan Turing, a very famous mathematician, or in these days probably would be called a computer scientist, um, is one of the architects behind some of the, the, the most prominent ideas in computer science today. Uh, he developed what's called the Turing test, which we'll read about in just a second. Um, but his, a lot of his work is, is the basis for much of what's covered, for instance, in computer science 121 here. Um, so this article goes on to, to say the following. So can machines think? That was the question posed by the great mathematician Alan Turing. Half a century later, six computers are about to converse with human interrogators in an experiment that will attempt to approve that the answer is yes. In the so-called Turing test, a machine seeks to fool judges into believing that it could be human. The test is performed by conducting a text-based conversation on any subject. If the computer's responses are indistinguishable from those of a human, it has passed the quote-unquote Turing test, and it can be said to be quote-unquote thinking. No machine has yet passed the test, this test devised by Turing, who did help crack German military codes during the Second World War. But at 9 a.m. next Sunday, six computer programs, aka artificial conversational entities, will, con uh, will answer questions posed by human volunteers at the University of Reading in a bid to become the first recognized thinking machine. If any program succeeds, it is likely to be hailed as the most significant breakthrough in artificial intelligence since the IBM supercomputer Deep Blue beat world chess champion Gary uh, Kasparov in 1997. It could also raise profound questions about whether a computer has the potential to be conscious and if humans should have the right to switch it off. So that was clearly the, the writer's sort of deep angle there. Um, <laughs> Professor, <laughs> Professor Kevin Warwick, a cyberneticist at the university, said, I would say now that machines are conscious, but in a machine-like way. Just as you see a bat or a rat is conscious, just as you see a bat or a rat is conscious like a bat or a rat, which is different from a human. I think, I did read that correctly too. I think the reason Alan Turing set up this game was that maybe to him consciousness was not that important, it's more the appearance of it. And this test is an important uh, aspect of appearance. The six computer programs taking part in this Sunday's test are called Alice, Brother Jerome, Elbot, Eugene Gustman, 
Jabberwocky, and Ultra Hal. Their designers will be competing for an 18 karat gold medal and $100,000 offered by the Loebner Prize in Artificial Intelligence. The test will be carried out by human interrogators, each sitting at a computer with a split screen. One half will be uh, operated by an unseen human, the other by a program. The interrogators will then begin separate, simultaneously, text-based conversations with both on them in any subjects they choose. After five minutes, they will be asked to judge which is which. If they get it wrong or are not sure, the program will have fooled them. And so the same article actually includes two transcripts of previous tests uh, with one of those machines. I thought we would pause for just a moment from sorting and searching to call up uh, two volunteers. How about, oh, Ken, you want to come up? Yuki as well? It looks like your hand was going up. So what these guys are going to mimic are um, the subjects that did partake in this very test some number of days ago. Uh, one of them is going to play the role of a human who was one of the subjects. The other is going to play the role of a computer. I'm going to play the role of the interrogator. But your job as the audience here is to figure out whether it's Yuki or Ken who is the computer or human talking back to me. So I have a script for Ken. Here's a script for me and Yuki. And again, the context here is that we'll start with Ken in conversation one. Um, that I am a real human, the interrogator here, and you're meant to decide if Ken is in fact human or computer. So you'll be subject. Oh, hi. My name is Nick, and I am human. It says hello. Okay. All oh, right. Hi. Are you? No, I don't need it. I'm good. Are you happy being a human? Yes, I am. Are you? Good. Then we are both happy. Yes, I am. Are you happy with your life at present? Parts of it. I hate my job, but most people do, right? I'm okay with mine. What is your job? I work as an online internet advertising monitor, which is fancy language for electronic filing. What do you do? I interrogate humans and machines. <laughs> which ones do you prefer, humans or machines? Which do you prefer? Hmm. Depends on for what purpose you mean. To go to a restaurant, for example. Then I would much prefer going with a human. Hmm, interesting. All right, so that's your conversation one. Now, Yuki is either human or computer. So conversation two, you are subject. Hello, my name is Mike and I am a man. <laughs> <laughs> are you happy being a man? Judge, I'm a guy. Does that worry you? Don't worry, we'll work everything through. Do you have worries then? Let's move on from that basis. Why? Why? I like this subject. What is the subject, do you think? What is the subject I wonder if I think? <laughs> I know that it's good to thonk about. Think deeply about mysterious subjects. What mysterious subjects? Think deeply about mysterious dubjects. <laughs> What's a dubject? <laughs> so you decide. Which was the human, which was the computer? Human or computer? Human or computer? <laughs> Indeed, this was in fact Ultra Hal, and this was Ken. So a round of applause perhaps for these guys. <laughs> Thank you. Want to hang on to that from there? <laughs> All right. So we left off last time talking about not only getting programs that are correct, but getting them efficient and getting them elegant, perhaps. And we talked specifically about searching and sorting. And to recap, we had algorithms like linear search, which was this very easy but very correct approach for finding someone, finding a number behind a door, finding a student in a crowd. And we said that asymptotically, in big O notation, what was the running time of uh, linear search? Yeah, so big O of n, but by converse, what was the best case, the omega running time for linear search? Yeah, so big O of uh, omega of 1, aka constant time, because in the best case specifically, that door whose number you're interested in just happens to be the very first one you pick. Whether you start at the left or the right, it just happens to be the very first one. But we improved upon this, because even in a room full of a few hundred people, something linear, though easy and correct, can very quickly become slow and tedious. And so we approached the problem with a bit more cleverness, and we introduced binary search. And we had this way back in week zero with the phone book example. But with binary search, we whittled down the upper bound, so to speak, on our running time to what? 
Yeah, log of n, which may be for re small numbers of people, small numbers of doors, not such a big deal. In fact, if you look really far to the left at those graphs we were drawing, you can find cases actually where the algorithms that are supposed to be better are actually slower for small inputs. But it's, it's the asymptotics, the big values of n, that we're going to start to care about more in a course like this and when designing bigger pieces of software. So in the long run, log n was really compelling. Because if we had, for instance, 4 billion students, well, how many, and, and those students are, say,、um, sorted from, let's say,、uh, in terms of、uh, their,、uh, the alphabetical nature of their names, and I'm looking for a specific person, much like I was looking for a number in the phone book. Well, four billion students, how many iterations am I going to have to endure maximally? 32. And that's where it gets really powerful, right? Because 2 to the 32 was roughly 4 billion. So that's where these kinds of ideas start to really carry some weight. But there was a cost. And one of the themes of Monday was that you never get anything for free. So, yeah, you can very easily, at least conceptually, chip away at your running time and go from something linear to logarithmic. But what did we pay in order to make binary search possible in the first place? So, we had to sort the elements. We either had to know in advance that the things were sorted, but in general, that's probably not such a safe assumption if it's being left to you to solve the problem, to count the students, to find the web page, to look up the phone number. You might have to do some work yourself. You might have to do some pre processing, so to speak, whereby you massage the data from the given format into something that's a little more versatile, a little more conducive to efficient searches. Some of you, actually, in problem set two for the hacker edition, have had this same thought. So, for those unfamiliar, the hacker edition does have students trying to Crack a set of passwords that we give them, but also an arbitrary input、um, that's an encrypted password. But we also give them access to a really big dictionary that on hacker2.cs50.net has like 400,000 words in it. And so, because that exists, that sort of allows you to bootstrap yourself to doing something a little more intelligent. You don't have to try all possible combinations of alphabetical characters or even punctuation initially. You can at least start your search. You can prioritize your search by starting with. Real words. Well, those real words are pretty much in a huge text file that are listed from、uh, top to bottom, left to right in that file alphabetically. But maybe that's not the best approach to actually searching through that information, especially if you want to maybe capitalize all those words in advance or force them all to lowercase. In short, even in this problem set, is there an opportunity to pre process the data so that you're not opening the raw dictionary file every time, but some sort of fancier version that you have pre prepared to expedite? Your own searches. But if you're not so lucky and you have to tackle it yourself in the context of, say, finding numbers behind doors, you're going to have to search, or sort rather. You're going to have to sort your values. And what did we conclude was one of our options? Well, to formalize, well, one of them was bubble sort. And this was probably this was the last one we sort of touched upon that one of our own、uh, volunteers proposed. And that was this idea of iteratively going left to right, look at adjacent elements, and if they're out of order, very simply, swap them. Then move on to the next pair, swap them if need be. Next pair, next pair, next pair. And we said maximally we're going to take like n steps to get to the very last pair of people, but we weren't done, right? Well, how many more times did we have to repeat this pass through all of our humans? So, sort of another n times. And you can think about this in different ways, right? Because the first time we step through our volunteers, I have to take like eight steps. But once I get someone in order, well, rather, then I have to go back to the beginning. But how many more times do I have to repeat that? Well, in the worst case, what, what's the worst case situation when sorting numbers like this? So, uh, so, uh, so n factorial, yes, if you sort them in the most naive way possible. But when I say now, worst case, in terms of the input, like what's the worst possible input you could feed a sorting algorithm? Like, So, it's completely reversed, right? You have to do all the work possible because everything is backwards. So, number one is way over there. So, with each of these passes through the list, with these swappings, well, we might have number two and number one here, but despite all those steps I took, how many places does number one actually move? Well, just one. And that's not bad. It's closer, to be sure. And number two is now at least on the correct side of him or her. But I've got to go back because each, with each pass, one of my elements is only going to move up one step. And if maximally those elements have to move all the way over here, n steps, it's like we're doing n things n times. And so that's n squared running time. And we'll actually be able to feel that in just a moment with a demo. How do we sort of summarize this? Well, some pseudocode here. So repeat the following n times. For each element, call it i. If i and its neighbor are out of order, 
swap them. We could have been a little more anal and said something like if element i and i plus 1 are out of order, then swap them. But really, this gets the point across. But we also had another approach, which was the first that our volunteers proposed on Monday. And that was to iteratively go through the list and just keep selecting the smallest element possible. So no matter where it is, go through the whole list and look, are you the smallest? Are you the smallest? Are you the smallest? And only once you've hit the end of the list can you definitively say, aha, number one is the smallest. I didn't find him here. I found him here. But conceptually, you can think about using like a local variable to remember who you saw and where you saw that smallest element. So you grab it. And then what did we do with it? Well, we sort of dragged them over to the end of the people, but then we had to make room for them. And dangerous might be to do what here in terms of efficiency? Right, so now I've got seven people in their original positions. I've yanked one person out of line, and I want to plop them into the beginning. What are our options if these people are in array? So we can either sort of move them all over, right? Like, excuse me, can you go this way? But how many steps is that? That's sort of like, n minus 1 steps because we're just one computer here, right? I have to manually do each of this. So if I need to cram this person in here and I need to do this sort of effect, every person needs to take a step to the left, which is n minus 1 people in the worst case, except for the hole we made in the list. But maybe there's a smarter way. Yeah, so let's just boot this person from their place in line because they're not even known to be in the right place at the moment. Let's just throw them where this person came from. And we've seen code in C for making swaps happen pretty efficiently. Three steps, one temporary variable. It's pretty easy to get that job done. So in constant time with bubble sort, can we, or with selection sort, can we perform the swap? So that then just begs the question, how many times or how many steps total does it take to perform selection sort? Well, when I walk through the list the first time, how many steps am I going to take maximally? N, and maximally is kind of misleading because I kind of have to take N steps because I don't have, I'm not some omniscient god that knows in this case what the smallest value should be. We've not been given that assumption. And the only way I'm going to know is if I go all the way to the end of the list. OK, so now I found it. I yank this person out of line. I boot this person and swap them over there without affecting anyone else. Now how many steps do I take on the next iteration? Just n minus 1, because this person is good to go. I can leave them be. And so we had this series of maybe n steps plus n minus 1 steps plus n minus 2. Or when we had a concrete example, it was like 8 plus 7 plus 6 plus 5 plus 4, dot, dot, dot. And that gave us a summation of, you know, from the back of the math book, n times n plus 1 over 2, which was roughly n squared. So it didn't seem to be fundamentally better. Well, let's take a look at these. So one of the neatest. Um, uses of a Java applet I've come across over time is this, this one here. We'll link this on the course's website under lectures. I'm going to go ahead and pick a sorting algorithm that these folks have implemented. You can already see there's going to be other algorithms that even we won't dwell on in the course, but there are countless ones out there uh, that folks have developed. Um, let's go ahead and decrease the delay so it's not terribly slow. I'm going to go ahead and click Start. And what this is now is a visualization of bubble sort. So rather than show you numbers, it's showing you bars whose height hints at the magnitude of those values. So a small bar is like the number 1, a really tall bar is like the number 100. So what's happening is the algorithm's going from left to right and flashing in red adjacent pairs, just like I was with my left hand and right hand on Monday. And if they're out of order, they're swapping. And so the effect of bubble sort is to, in fact, bubble the biggest numbers up to the right hand side, the top, and the smaller numbers sort of bubble their way down to the left hand side. And we're running this at a decent clip here, and it seems clear that it's going to work. Well, let's just get a sense of the speed here. Maybe next year we'll run it at a delay of like 15, though. All right, so what's about to happen? They're about to be sorted. So, <laughs> OK. So let's assume that it's correct. Let's move on to, oh, all right, we got this far. All right, don't give up at the last minute before you. <laughs> ah, woo! That's great. We'll, we'll applaud for everything in this class. <laughs> All right. So let's stop. And now let's start with selection sort. I'll run it a little faster, though don't conflate my manual speed with the algorithm itself. 
All right, so let's click. Come on, start, resume, reload. Oh, apparently selection sort just doesn't work. All right, so we'll come back to that. But what you would see is a similar. Oh, there we go. Don't reload now. Okay. So notice we won't go, go through to fruition here, but notice what's happening here. You're selecting quite literally the smallest elements, plopping them into place. Again, it is going faster, but I'm running it literally like as though it were on a faster computer. But you can see that nothing moves at the right hand side until we rip someone out of line, swap him out, and then we've in fact sorted them. But if we actually did this with really large input and even counted up the number of comparisons and or swaps, we'd find that in the long run, bubble sort, selection sort, they're really not all that different asymptotically in terms of their running time. So which is better? Give me an argument that bubble sort is better than selection sort. Anything. Anything reasonable. Yeah. So you don't need to store any information. That is, you don't have to remember with like a local variable what the smallest element is that you've seen, because you're sort of stateless. You go from left to right again and again. You do have to keep track of one thing, otherwise you'll have an infinite loop, right? You at least have to keep track of how many times you're iterating. And in fact, there's a little optimization you could do with bubble sort. Do I have to go through the list with n steps, n times necessarily? <laughs> okay, true. If I had access to multiple computers, I could do it a lot faster. But even, let's assume a single computer here, and I only can manipulate the data with a single CPU. What's a slight optimization here? Yeah. Yeah, so here sort of speaks to this element of design, even when it comes to problem sets. So what's the best case scenario for these sorting algorithms? Well, you're handed a list that's already sorted. So it'd be kind of dumb to watch a simulation, let alone code up a simulation, whereby even though the list is sorted, you, sort of like an idiot, walk through the list n times, you do nothing because everyone's in order, and then just because the algorithm told you to, you do it again looking for adjacent pairs that are out of order, right? And you know, you laugh. We'll, we'll find Find little bugs like this in your code, I'm sure. And you do this n times, right? So not terribly efficient. So what's the fix to this, this not bug per se, but this inefficiency? I'm going to keep doing this until you answer this question. What? Uh, say once more. Okay, so have a recursive method. How does that save me? Keep talking. <laughs> Ah, okay. So I don't know if I would slap the label recursion on this, but I think one of the one of the uh, the point that you were making though was if you keep track of how many, <laughs> look like a real idiot if I do it this way, um, you keep track of whether or not you made any swaps, right? We can still do the same algorithm, just add a local variable and and do what? Exactly. So throw a little bit of memory at it, right? You get nothing for free. So spend a little more memory, but initialize that memory to zero. And then anytime you make a swap, do a plus plus on it. Because then when you get to the end of the first iteration, you say if counter equals equals zero, break or exit or quit or whatever the appropriate response is, and you're done. So that suggests that the naive, the sort of easy version of bubble sort is big O of n squared and omega of n squared, because there is no such optimization here. I'm saying repeat the following n times. For each of your n elements, call each i, do the following. That's n times n is n squared. But clearly, can we whittle down what's fundamentally the same algorithm by inserting a little more intelligence, a little better design, and now leave the upper bound alone, n squared, but whittle the lower bound down to something that's much more compelling, like what's the omega notation with this optimization? Omega of n, because I just have to look at each of the elements once. And so in real world terms, like that's compelling. If you've got a large data set, something like Excel, and you're sorting a lot of records, you'd kind of hope that Microsoft, even if they very naively implemented bubble sort because it was easy and they remembered it from you know, CS1, well, you would hope they at least had that one condition in there that checks, did you make any swaps? Because otherwise, sorting a million records is going to take a million squared operations, which is huge as opposed to just one million operations. So there's even real world implications of this stuff. Give me something that's good about selection sort. 
Uh, less number of swaps. Yeah, so you're not moving the memory around as much. Sure, so you, because instead you're selecting the number and then just switching the two there. And what do you like about that specifically? Okay, it's not a bad idea. And I could sort of come to the rescue here and propose that if you had large enough chunks of memory, touching every piece of memory, at that, well, swapping, hmm. I don't know. Let me think about that if I can sort of back that up. But, so I'm not sure. But it's a, it's a reasonable thought. Other, other thoughts that are good, or maybe even bad about this. No, maybe bad, it's a little more complicated, right? There's kind of this elegance here. Do the following n times. Check every pair. Swap if out of order. Done. Right? So there's a little more involved here, but there are sort of more subtle implications that if we were actually to code these up, we would find them, whether it's in the difficulty of the coding, the amount of memory that we need to store. But for now, we'll leave the takeaway as they're both kind of bad. They're both kind of slow. And we'll see just how slow shortly. But then one of our volunteers touched on this idea of, well, you know, divide and conquer, phone book ripping. This has kind of been a good thing thus far. We seem to gain something from, from doing that approach of splitting problems into smaller pieces. Well, even the greedy approach on uh, problem set one was sort of about biting off part of the problem and then dealing with the smaller piece. So that's a kind of a nice theme. And it turns out we can define merge sort, which was proposed verbally on Monday, with this pseudocode. So given n elements, do the following. Well, first do a sanity check. If there's fewer than two elements, you're kind of done trivially, right? There's only one or zero elements. In either case, the elements are sorted. But then we're going to do the following. Sort the left half of the elements, sort the right half of the elements, and then if you've got two sorted halves, well, it kind of makes intuitive sense to just merge them together, you know, sort of plucking them together and then like weaving them together, and then bam, you've got one big sorted list from two halves. So this suggests what kind of approach? I'll steal your, your answer from before. What, what is this, uh, um, this approach here? There's a buzzword we can slap on this algorithm. So this is recursive. Wherein lies the recursiveness? How is it recursive? Yeah, so we keep splitting it in two. And specifically, what do those lines say? Well, in the else clause here, it says sort left half of elements. And then the next line, sort right half of elements. Well, how in the world are we going to sort the left half? Well, wait a minute. We kind of have an algorithm on the board itself for sorting. Why don't we use that same algorithm with an input that's half as big? Well, what if we get then to sort the left half of the left half? Well, what are we going to do with that? Well, again, apply this same algorithm. And what's kind of neat about this is that maybe on first glance, it's almost as though you're weaving this circular argument where, well, I'll sort the elements just by sorting the elements. But because of one key feature, not just the recursiveness, but this first line here, why does this save that, that, ar that um, circularity from just completely devolving into an infinite loop? Yeah, so as soon as the list is so small that it's trivial to sort it, you're done with that case. This is your so-called base case, and the recursion stops. The additional function calls stop. So in other words, if you can whittle the problem down from n to n over 2 to n over 4 to n over 8 to n over 16, dot, 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 to one element, I know how to sort one element, right? What do I do? Leave it alone, right? I've sorted one element. But then there must be some additional insight here. Right? Because that doesn't really seem to be doing anything for us. If you just claim, we'll take all the n elements, whittle them down into individual elements, and done. Like, they're sorted, uh, you know, in a vacuum. Well, where's the magic then in this algorithm? Yeah. Yeah, it's in that merging process. When you have one element that's sorted in the left hand, so to speak, one element that's sorted trivially in the right hand, well, it's when you actually merge them two together, maybe moving them like this instead of like this, that something real is actually happening. Ah, so how is that different from bubble sort? Well, it certainly has similarities. Um, the, ver the sort of obvious difference is, is that bubble sort is entirely iterative. It gets the same job done. But there's going to be this beauty in inherent in merge sort that allows us to do that same job of sorting much, much faster. And we'll see just how fast, just how fast now, actually. So let's take a look at what we actually mean by this. So, Thanks to, uh, I hopped on the, the Wikipedia before class, and thankfully someone had whipped up a really nice diagram so that we didn't have to draw this in chalk. And so this is 
what will start as inputs, since this is all kind of magical on first glance. So here's an array of seven elements. They're clearly unsorted. They're presumably randomly chosen, but they're at least all non negative. They're, in fact, positive. So this is an array of elements, and my goal now is to sort them. I know how to do it with bubble sort, right? We could sort of take left hand, right hand, and just go back and forth, back and forth, swapping. We can do selection sort similarly, and, but we could count up the number of swaps that takes and just asymptotically say it's going to take big O of n squared, because this clearly is not the best case. So maybe we can. Do better. Well, what can we do? Well, according to merge sort, which again, just keep this in mind, really doesn't say all that much that's hard to remember, right? Sort left half, sort right half, merge the two halves. So we don't really need to pull this slide up again. So what does that mean? Well, unfortunately, I've got seven elements here. So as came up the other day with binary search, you kind of have to be careful with your math and how you're truncating or rounding. But clearly, we can, we're going to have to divide the list into two halves. Two unequal halves in this case. So four and three. All right, so literally all I've done is split the list conceptually into two. So I've drawn a line between three and nine, and everything to the left of it, 38, 27, 43, and three, are in the quote unquote left half, and 9, 82, and 10 are in the right half. They're being forked off like this for now, just for the sake of clarity. But there is an interesting implication of how you do this. So what do I do next? How do I sort two lists, one of size four, one of size three? Right, so split them again, right? Sort the left half of elements. Well, the left half at the moment is four elements, so I need to sort its left half, which is going to be two elements. Well, that's just going to be 38 and 27, and that's going to be 43 and 3. Now, in fact, if we really want to tell this story accurately, none of this has happened yet. So I'm going to cover that up, right? Because the first step in the algorithm was sort the left half. Then we sort of called myself. So that puts on hold anything involving the right half. So now what happens next is sort the left half again. So now we're at this step. What happens next? So next we go down to the left half. So I have to cover up even more of this because really we're only dealing with left halves here for the moment. So let me, fortunately, I brought all my notes from college so I can cover that up. And so this is literally where we are in the story right now, I've,、oh, except for this guy here. So now we're at this point in the story. So this is kind of cool because now I'm at, I was at the point a moment ago of a list of size 2, 38 and 27. And now I needed to sort that thing. Well, how do I sort it? Well, I sort the left half. All right, that gives me the number 38. How do I sort that? Well, n is now less than 2, done, right? Do nothing, return. There's no more recursion. So it doesn't really seem to have made much progress, but what happens next mentally? So I sorted the left a moment ago. I was at the two list element, two element list. Then I sorted the left half. Then what happened? Done. Like base case applied, which means conceptually we're now going backwards in the stack. So that function returns, so it gets ripped off the stack. So whereas I was going up, 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 up in memory, now I'm going one step down because that function call has finished. So now I'm back here. What do, what's the next step in this guy's algorithm? Sort the right half. So now I can pull this piece of paper away because now I sort his right half, but his right half is just a singleton as well. So what happens next? So、uh, now I go back to this guy. He returns. He gets ripped off the stack, his memory. Now I'm at this point. I've sorted this guy's left half, the pair called 38 and 27. I've sorted this guy's right half. Now what do I do? But not return. I need to merge them together. So I'm going to get probably a little sloppy with the paper here. So I'll just rip it away in a moment anyway. But how do I merge those two things? Well, the simplest way I would say is if I have, let me make sure this fits, what I would be doing sort of mentally is I'm going to put my left hand on 38, my right hand on 27, and these are singletons. How do I merge them? I sort of need to decide who comes first, left hand or right hand. Well, in this case, obviously right hand. So I plop 27 down into a new memory location. Now I'm done with the right hand list. It was only of size one. What do I do? Well, clearly the next guy to go in the list is my left hand. And so the merging has actually done kind of a swap. But it's not a swap outright, because one of the key differences about merge sort, unlike bubble and、uh, selection, is for this step to happen, what do we seem to need? So you actually tend to you use extra memory. So if your array was of size n, merge sort in typical implementations uses a second array, initially empty, of the same size, so that you have some place to dump the numbers while you're merging them. So it's, again, to this point of never getting anything for free, it's going to help us time wise, but we're going to pay for it in space. So now at this point, 
We've just merged two lists. Why did we merge those two lists? Well, because we were trying to sort this list of two. So what happens now? Well, we kind of go backwards, backwards, because now this guy was once the left side of another list, formerly known as a four element list. So we're now sort of in our story back at the, the middle here, 38, 27, 43, 3. What was the point at which we left off with him? Sort the right half and then dive down deeper. And I'm just going to um, peel away the rest of the details here because the idea is the same, even if it's a little hard to keep track of the logic at first. But what we have now is a tree or graph that doesn't exist in memory so much simultaneously. This is more of a, a depiction of what's going on. But if we want to trace it in terms of steps, if you can see this, this was sort of step one in red there. Then I did step two, sort the left half. Then I did step three, sort the next left half. Then I did step four, sort its left half. Then what did I do? Yeah, then I sorted its right half, which was like step five here. And then what did I do? Then I merged them. So this whole thing here was like a big step six. And then I sort of now have to go back in this tree. OK, so if that was step six, it looks like this guy here is step seven, if I'm doing this right. And this is step eight. Then this is step nine. And then I had to merge these guys, which makes this 10. So in other words, even though this tree might seem a little unwieldy, well, if you just kind of go as far left and as far down as you can, then go up a little, then down again, then back a little, then go down again, you're sort of trying to dive into all the possible holes or follow all the possible branches that you can until you're at the point where you have two halves at the same level in this graph that you can then merge. So let's suppose now. We're at the point where we have a list of size 2, a left half that's sorted, because it is, 27, 38. And then we have a list of size 2, 3, and 43 that's sorted. So step 11, if I'm doing this correctly, I think is this big guy here. Right? Now I've got left half sorted, right half sorted. Let's merge them together. How do I do that? Well, I think the simplest way for me to think about it is put your left hand on 27, the start of the first list, your right hand on 3, the start of the second list, then ask yourself which hand's supposed to come first in the right order. 3, so I plop 3 into my temporary memory that I've pre-allocated. Then I move plus plus my right hand to point at 43. Left hand still at 27, so now I compare 27 and 43. Clearly 27 comes next, so I plop him into my temporary memory. I increment my left hand, plus plus. So now I'm pointing at the last elements of those lists, both of size 2. I repeat that process until I now have a list of size 4. And now I don't think we have to walk through the whole other branch of the tree, but that is at the end of the story where I have just sorted the left half of a list of size what? Of size 7. The original list, left half, is now sorted in its entirety, which means that very first function call I made has finally unwound, so to speak, and now I can dive down the right branch, this branch here, and take care of the same thing there. So let's assume for its discussion that that just happened, and we're at the point in our story where we now have this list, which is called dot, 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 whatever number that happens to be. So now we have a, le a left hand side that's sorted, a right hand side that's sorted. The very last step in this algorithm is the line called merge sorted halves. And that line belongs to the very first invocation of merge sort, the thing that got us started in the story. So what happens? Well, I take out conceptually my left hand, right hand. I kind of walk through the lists, plopping down the numbers in the right order. And at the end of the day, I still have my original list, it seems, here in memory. But in my temporary memory, I've plopped in another set, the same seven elements, or copies thereof, but in a sorted order. And I appear to be done, right? 3, 9, 10, 27, 38, 43, 82 is now sorted. So the more interesting question now is how long did that take? It took about five minutes, it seems. But <laughs> asymptotically, in terms of n, is it n squared? Is it n? Is it constant? Something else, yeah? Yeah, so it is in fact n log n, which is somewhere in between just log n and n squared, right? If you kind of think about it, even if you're not quite comfortable yet with logarithms uh, still. So n log n is better than n squared, but it's not as good as log n because log n was like binary search. So n log n, n times log n. Well, how do we get that? Well, let's ask ourselves this. Well, every time, how many times did we divide the list in two, in two, in two? 
Yeah, so log n, right? Anytime you divide something into halves again and again and again until you bottom out at singletons or like a single page in the phone book, you've done that log n times, right? And the same deal here. So at this point in the story, we have all these different singletons. And then what do I have to do on every sort of row? So this is the height, the height of this tree, so to speak, we've just claimed is log n up until this point. You know, give or take, plus or minus one, for the sake of、uh, just to wave our hands at minor details. So the height of this tree is log n. How many merges, or how wide, are each of these rows? In other words, when I've split the list into two lists of size four and three, how many steps are involved at that level in my story? Well, it's the merging. Right? How do you merge a list of size four and a list of size three? Well, you put your left hand on one and your right hand on the other. And how many times do I move my fingers collectively to the right? N, right? Because I'm going to touch physically every element, every one of the seven elements once, because once I've touched each of them, I've dumped them into their appropriate locations. So there was some, mer there was some merging that happened、uh, down here, right? And here, and here. There was some merging that we then did here. And here, and here, some merging here, here. So, how many elements are on each of these levels? Well, we have n elements here, n elements here, n elements here, and n elements here. Well, what's the height here? Well, it's the same thing, it's symmetric, right? So, this is also log n. So, it looks like I'm doing something log n times n times, yes? You know, even if you want to nitpick and say, well, wait a minute, the height of this tree is not log n, it's two times log n. Fine, fine, right? To log n, but what do we say about constant factors on Monday? Yeah, like, not that interesting, right? We care about the higher order terms, which in this case are going to be n and log n. So, in fact, the overall running time of this thing is n log n, because we've split the list log n times in half, and how many elements did we have to touch at each such iteration? How, many, how much work did we have to do every, at every row in this graph? Well, n things. Now, if that's a little strange to think about, let's take a different approach but get to the same answer. So, I'm going to claim, albeit with a formula this time, that the running time of this algorithm is very easily specified, right? So, this was the pseudocode. If n is less than 2, return. That's constant time, not that interesting a step. Else, sort the left half, sort the right half, merge the sorted halves. So, let's just ask ourselves on paper pencil, how much time does that take? Well, if Uh, n is less than 2, how much time does this algorithm take? Like no time, maybe one step, maybe two steps, whatever. It's constant. I'm just going to chalk it up as 0 for simplicity. But we could do it the same way with any other constant. Well, what about the more general case? If the list of elements to be sorted is of size n and you need to sort the left half, sort the right half, then merge the sorted halves, what's the running time? Well, this is. n over 2, time of n over 2, half the list, plus another running time of sorting half the list, plus big O of n. And this is just my way of saying how much time does the merging take? Well, if you just assume that merging is really just this finger pointing exercise where you walk through each list of size n over 2, you're touching each element once, so that's like n touches total. So that's like big O of n, or just specifically n steps. So we seem to be able to express formulaically What the running time of this thing is. Well, let's see if it checks out then. All right, so how long does it take for the sake of discussion to sort 16 elements? Let's just plug in some values. So if I want to de- check the running time for t equals 16 or n equals 16, that's like two times the running time for t of eight elements, right? Left half, right half, plus 16 for the merging. To merge eight elements with another eight elements takes 16 touches of those elements, 16 comparisons. All right, well, what, now we have sort of a recursive problem, right? A circular problem. What's t of 8? We don't know what that is yet, so let's do it. t of 8 is 2 times t of 4 plus 8. t of 4 is 2 times t of 2 plus 4. Well, what's t of 2? t of 2 is 2 times t of 1, left half, right half, single elements both, plus two steps to merge those two elements. Well, what's t of 1? Well, that was the base case. And this, again, is the magic in recursion. So long as you bottom out with a hard coded case, Everything else will sort of unravel in such a way that the total answer is correct because now we can just substitute. So it's a lot of numbers on the board at once, but let's, I just flipped it upside down. t of 1 is 0. Well, t of 2 is 2 times t of 1 plus 2. So I just did substitution. Then I took this value, substitution, this value, substitution, this value, substitution. So t of 16 is t, 2 times t of 8 plus 16, which if you do all the basic arithmetic is 48 plus 16. Which is 
And is that consistent? Well, let's see. If we have 16 elements, 16 elements squared, 16 elements squared is 256, whereas log of, uh, let's see, n, 16 times log n. So log of what, six, log base 2 of 16, 4. So 4 times 16, yeah, it checks out. It's n log n. All right, so maybe underwhelming. So what does this really mean? Well, let's take a look what this means in real terms. So this example, it's not as colorful, but it allows you, and you can see here that folks have taken it upon themselves to implement bozo sort, stooge sort, cocktail sort, shaker sort. Pretty much if you come up with an algorithm, apparently you're allowed to name it yourself. Uh, let's choose bubble sort since we're familiar. Let's choose selection sort since we're familiar. Though insertion sort was one that came up in conversation on Monday. And then let's choose merge sort. And again, even though things are rotated laterally this time, the height of the bars speaks to the size of the numbers being sorted. And I'm going to sort of simulate these three things operating all at once by just clicking them, clicking their start buttons really fast in succession. So let's see what happens. Bubble, selection, and merge sort. Like that's the power of these things. That's the power of better design. Right? And if we could really hammer home the point, and sort of twiddle our thumbs while bubble sort and selection sort kind of finish their thing. But that's pretty consistent. You can come up with crazy corner cases where sometimes algorithms perform not quite optimally or as ideally as you might like. But that's pretty powerful for a random demo to suggest that much of an improvement. And there it has. Finished. Almost. Bubble sort. Looks like it's going to win. <laughs> so, <laughs> tied for second. Tied for second. So there's all sorts of, uh, all sorts, of sorts. Um, we've spoken of a few of them here, but there are others still. And in fact, when you use library code, those of you who ever called the sort method in Java and AP Computer Science, I believe Java uses, I think used to use quick sort, now uses, uses a variant of merge sort, and then other libraries too tend to standardize on something called quick sort or some of these others. Typically not so much the bubble sorts or the selection sorts or the insertion sorts, but sort of in our defense, they're among the easier ones certainly to explain at first pass. Well, now let's see if we can come back to an example from last time, which was simply about sigma. Right? Remember, our source code here was sigma1.c, was just this program with which we were able to count up all the numbers from 1 to n. So we want to empower you this week, especially as you finish up or start problem set 2, um, some new tricks that will become even more powerful next week and beyond when we start to play with these things called pointers. So a quick refresher, this main routine has a do while loop that just nags the user for a positive int. And it does so until it gets actually a positive integer. Then we call this function called sigma, passing in an argument of n, storing the result in answer. And then we print the answer. And then sigma itself was just this thing here. It was an iterative approach counting from 0 up to n, or m in this case, and just adding those numbers together. Well, one of the most powerful things that is so underutilized by most students in a course like this, myself included back in the day, is a debugger. So GDB, the GNU debugger, is a Linux-based program that's very popular. It sort of plays nicely with GCC. So it turns out that when you all have been running make, let me go ahead and remove sigma 1. So notice I have my source code, sigma 1, sigma 2. If I just do this, so gcc o sig, uh, sigma 1 and then sigma 1.c. So that does in fact create a binary. Whoops, uh, I need the LCS50. So that does create a binary called sigma 1, but there's nothing special in it, really. Only if, the only stuff in it are the zeros and ones required to make the program run. But it turns out that if you add a, an additional flag to GCC, namely dash G GDB, and then hit enter, you still get a binary. But let's take a look at this section. Let me go ahead and start from scratch here. Let me run the first command uh, without that new flag. LS dash L. All right, so the size of sigma 1 is 12, uh, 955. Now I'm going to delete it, sigma 1. Now I'm going to recompile with that additional flag, the dash g gdb, enter, do ls dash l, and notice, damn it. <laughs> chuckle, chuckle. All right. Never do demos on the fly. 
Well, it turns out that despite what I was trying to show you, is that um, Make, for instance, when you run this yourself, it has been, it has been uh, spitting out that flag automagically for you. So notice among the things that have been spit out is this one here. Oh, foiled by my own aliases. All right, so I'm going to save myself here. Turns out anytime you've been running GCC because of an alias, a shortcut we've set up on Nice, we've been making GCC without telling you include these special flags. Dash W all is give you all warning. So the GCC really nags you if you've done something that's not wrong but uh, risky. Um, standards uh, equals C99 means use the newer version of C. Um, dash G GDB does precisely what I was, was talking about there. So in fact, let me see if I can save myself here, otherwise dig a deeper hole. I'm going to rerun GCC in quotes, which removes the effects of our aliasing. OK, so that's annoying. So right, we're using features of um, C that didn't exist back then. So let's manually add this back. It does compile ls-l. OK, whew, slightly smaller. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Saved a little face there, perhaps. Let's go ahead back to the old way, sigma 1. So what I'm going to do now is I can run this program, sigma 1, and positive integer, give me 5, right? And we said if you start giving really big numbers, can bad things happen? Eh, yes, with this one, you can get uh, overflow of int, right? Eventually, we'll probably overflow the bounds of an int, like 4 billion or 2 billion. And apparently, this is just taking a really long time. But we were really able to make sigma 2 bomb completely. And why was that? Right, we pretty quickly got seg faults with sigma 2. What was different about it? So it was recursive. So the limit in memory wasn't just the size of the int that you were putting your answer in, but it was how much stack space we were allowed. So we were able to crash this program much more easily. But let's focus for now on sigma 1, which does seem to work. But this time, rather than run it, I'm going to run GDB sigma 1. And now I get a whole bunch of sort of like uh, welcome to our program type text. And then I'm at a GDB prompt, which is distinct from the nice prompt. And what I can do now is type the command run. And what this does is it runs my program, Sigma 1, but inside this special sandbox environment within a debugger, a program meant to help you find bugs. And it runs your program, but it allows you to pause your program and sort of poke around, literally memory, to see what's going on. So I'm prompted for an integer, please. I'll give it 5, enter. 15, program exited normally. So we didn't really seem to gain much. But let me do this. I'm going to type break main. And what that means is set a breakpoint, pause execution of this program at the point at which main starts executing, which in this case is right at the beginning, which is useful. So now let's type run. Nothing happens because notice I've already hit breakpoint one. Notice that the program's nice and friendly. It says, hey, by the way, this is in sigma 1.c, line 27, which is useful if you have a second window up. You can sort of follow along that way. This is apparently line 27 in my code. It's showing me what it is because if I want to now execute it and proceed to the next line, I quite literally type next. Now that is about to, uh, that line will have gotten executed in a moment, but notice, for the astute, right? Demo hasn't blown up in my face yet. It didn't print yet. Why? This is that nuisance from like a week or two ago. Buffering, right? Like if you don't put the new line character, sometimes the program waits until it's ready. And that makes sense here because there was new new line because I just aesthetically wanted to get the int first. All right, so yes, let's let get int get called. So let's move to the next statement. There it is. Positive integer, please. I'm going to give it five. Enter. And now look, it's not computing just yet. It's showing me what's about to get executed. If I type list, if I don't have a second window up, it'll just list the next several lines of code just before and just after this part in the program. And that's useful because I'm now at line, uh, what was it, uh, line 30. So I just did line 30. If I hit next again, what's going to happen? So again, the program for reference was this guy here. So the program was right here. So I've just inputted the number 5. We're checking the condition. Is the condition going to check out? Obviously. So we're going to break out of the while loop. So now if I type next again, I'm going to get down to this line. Now, do I want this to happen? Well, let's see. You know, I'm kind of curious. What's inside of the variable called answer before I even put anything there? So I'm seeing the line of code, to be clear, before it's getting executed. So I'm going to print answer. Woohoo. Weird. What's going on? So this is kind of a funky value to be in my answer. 
But remember, this is why you initialize your variables. You should not, you cannot make assumptions generally as to what your variables contain if you didn't put that value there itself. In fact, this is probably remnants of some other part of my program's execution, or back in the day, someone else's program's execution, which is an even scarier thing. Though these days, things are a little more compartmentalized. So let's see. I'm going to hit next. That's going to execute my sigma function. OK, that seems to have、uh, moved me past that. Now let's print answer. Print answer. OK, that's good. So now it's stored my answer in 15. If I hit next again, it's going to print my answer. Now we're kind of at the end of the story. Now, oh, this is kind of weird, but don't get sort of freaked out by this. This just means now I'm sort of stepping into code that I didn't myself write. So I just want to get out of this. I'm going to let it run to,、uh, I'm going to let it run to completion by hitting continue. And there, it hit the end. But let's do a little fancier stuff. So let's do,、uh, we still have main. So let's go ahead and run. OK, I'm back at the beginning. So next. OK, next. Let's give it five. OK, next. OK, now I want to poke around sigma. So I could set a breakpoint at sigma, or I can just step into the function that's about to get executed. If I hit step, notice that now I'm inside of sigma1.c line 51, which happens to be lower in that file inside of my sigma function. And now if I type list, here's the function. If I type print m, what am I going to see inside of m? M is the parameter to sigma. What did he get past? So it should be five. It is. It is. So it is five. So if I hit、uh, next, that first line of real code is going to execute. The condition goes past it because it's not applicable. Int sum gets zero. What's sum first? OK, sum is initially five. That's kind of interesting. Maybe a coincidence. Let's hit next. OK, now we have this. What's i by default? Whew. So that's a big I, right? That's why you initialize I. Let's go ahead and hit next. Let's go ahead and hit next. Whoops, next. You can do funky things like display. If I'm tired of typing M all the time or I, display I, it will just constantly remind you. You can type next. If you get tired of typing next, you can type the first letter of most of these commands. So N, 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 N. Notice it's summing it up, returning sum. Let's go ahead and continue. And bam. So, what you'll find on the course's website under resources is a handout, which is a GDB、uh, cheat sheet of sorts. Do start using this. You'll find it to be an invaluable tool. We hope you have a wonderful time with your cryptography problem sets. My gift to you is 20 minutes of your life back, and we'll see you on Monday. <laughs>